six or seven percent of them. Fantastic. But I will uh, say thank you to Danny, who really did a great job of explaining the family. Shut up. That's why I uh, say six months not having to do that. Uh, we can really talk about what we're really interested in, which is the implementation. Um, so let me just jump into it. So a couple of acknowledgments. The biggest acknowledgment is to our funders at the CDC, uh, who uh, awarded two grants within this thing called the Child Obesity Research Demonstration Project, or 2.0. Uh, and my like MPI, Katie Berkeley, was here, um, uh, and I were funded uh, along with Massachusetts Department of Public Health and the uh, Harvard School of Public Health folks, uh, with the other grant within this. So, as you guys all know, this kind of work really does take a village, and this is just our investigator team. This is not even our community partner, the support staff. Um, it's, this is just our TIs and our co investigators. So we have folks at uh, Arizona State University, which is where the, most of this, the project is actually happening. And then we have uh, folks at Northwestern University, uh, as well as the University of Washington, the University of Southern California. I'll tell a little bit more about some of their roles within the project here in a second. So we have called this the Raising Healthy Children Project. Um, that was to kind of differentiate from the intervention itself, which is a family check for health. Uh, and Margaret uh, reminded me, or let me know, I guess, uh, I didn't know this, that uh, the SDRG actually has uh, an intervention called Raising Healthy Children. So <laughs> probably should have Googled that. Or maybe it's still studying logos and stuff. Uh, but it's just a project name. So I think project name. <laughs> it's a project name. <laughs> <laughs> so just a really kind of a brief overview. Um, so this core 2.0 actually was uh, kind of uh, birthed out of the core one, which was another initiative from the CDC. And one of the things they did, they learned right at that core 1.0 was that the service contracts they had the hardest time getting uh, obesity management programs to use was primary care. Uh, and it's one of the most challenging environments uh, compared to community schools and prisons. So they have this 2.0 that is exclusively focused on integration with the pediatric primary care environment. So in our study, we are recruiting 350 low-income families. These are families that either are on or would qualify for CHIP. Um, they don't necessarily have to actually be insured by, but they have to meet the qualifications. The children are age 6 to 12 years and have simply a BMI that is in the overweight or obese range, so greater than or equal to the 85th percentile for age and gender. We designed this as a pragmatic effectiveness implementation hybrid trial, and I'm going to focus a lot on that part of it, uh, and the implementation part of it in this talk today to kind of show another side of the, of the coin here, kind of what we're dealing with in this, in this kind of research. And then one of the challenges, too, for, for us as the uh, investigative team is it was a boatload of money, which is great, thank you. Uh, but they said, eh, go ahead and do everything for me months. So in some ways, the CDC's RFA for this was really forward thinking. In other ways, it was really challenging, uh, of course, for us to actually to complete all of our aims within the project period. So speaking of the aims, here are our four aims. Um, so one of the things we're going to do is refine the family checkup for health intervention, which is an adaptation and enhancement of the original family checkup model that uh, Danny talked about here in the last, the last uh, talk. We also wanted to evaluate the effectiveness of the family checkup for health on the management of pediatric obesity, as well as some of the things that we think are going to be mechanisms of change um, and some related health behaviors to go along with it, like asthma management. As you can see, though, one thing that we did do was focus a lot on implementation strategies and the actual implementation. We are fairly certain, fairly confident, um, delusionally so, potentially, uh, that if we can actually get this embedded, it will be effective in actually achieving quite a lot of things. The challenge has always been, and this is not just for us, but I think we're all kind of creating a similar theme, is how do we actually do it? How do we actually get this implemented? So we have a number of sub-aims for our implementation. One of them is to, to evaluate the quality of implementation using observational and automated coding methods. So we'll talk about that specifically. We also want to evaluate the economic impact, which I won't talk about today, but this is part of our symposia uh, tomorrow. And you guys have another handout that talks specifically talks a lot about our economic uh, evaluation plan. And then our last thing is really kind of we're leading up to developing a sustainability plan for CEO. CDC explicitly told us you guys need to at the end of this trial figure out what is needed to do this at a statewide, regional, or national level. Yes, uh, lofty goals. Uh, and the last thing we wanted to do, which is actually really important for the other aims, is to evaluate the utilization and satisfaction that families have, as well as the, the pediatric clinics have with our family general health intervention. 
So I want to put this in context of kind of where we are in the kind of grand scheme of the traditional translational research pipeline. So like I said, we're fairly confident that under ideal circumstances that the family checkup for health will have an impact on children's weight and related issues. We are in the point now of actually really testing this within kind of an effectiveness study that does it actually work when we do it in more realistic real world circumstances. And then really a lot of our focus is on this kind of stage, this latter stage of implementation and dissemination science. It really has to deal with the question of how do you make it work anymore? It's not does it actually, is it going to work? It's how do you actually make it work? So looking a little bit closer at this, um, I just want to highlight one thing here within the kind of last stage here of implementation is that this is really uh, kind of been conceived as an implementation research project. And so what we're trying to do is evaluate the use of strategies uh, to integrate new interventions, which is the for health, uh, into real world pediatric settings to improve uh, patient outcomes. And the point is we want to actually be able to really generalize the knowledge. Not just local knowledge that one particular clinic can say, hey, we did this, it worked for us, maybe it would work for you. That's really important. There's actually a nice feedback between local knowledge and generalizable knowledge. But we designed a study to actually produce generalized knowledge. So one thing that's kind of challenging is wrapping our head around the difference between effectiveness research and implementation research, especially for those of us who come from more of a traditional clinical background, uh, where we're working with randomized clinical trials and kind of what the expectations are of those. So even in the world of effectiveness, let alone uh, efficacy, what we're really interested in at the foreground is the intervention itself. We really want to know is this if, if we actually evaluate this under you know, a randomized controlled trial kind of situation compared to treatment as usual or to a no treatment control, can we actually improve health outcomes? And really the system that supports the adoption and those three interventions is not that important. It's there in some, to some extent, but it's not something that we're as interested in. If you flip the, the script a little bit here, in implementation research, we're really more interested in the system that supports the adoption of the, of the intervention and a little bit less in the intervention itself. And so when we're actually thinking about Evaluating implementation, we're really concerned with things like the quality of delivery, the quantity, which has to do with how much you know, actually get delivered for the number of people that are actually in need, so the reach or penetration rates, and also potentially the speed of delivery or the efficiency with which you can actually get things out there. So, I'm not the first person to say this, but essentially when we start thinking about testing evidence-based programs in real-world settings, you really have to shift the way that you actually even think about what we, what we consider research and data. I don't know what I flashed. So one thing that's really important is to differentiate between interventions versus implementation strategies. They're both things that we do to manipulate the system, but in interventions is really more the uh, kind of traditional way of thinking about these are our clinical and preventive interventions. And this can be broken down into seven P's. I'm not going to go through each one of them. You can read them if you'd like. Uh, but essentially, what we're talking about family care for health, we're running on a program, we're running on a preventive intervention or a, or a uh, you know, secondary preventive intervention program itself. We want to try to get into a pediatric number How we actually do that is through implementation strategies. So just the definition of that. So implementation strategies are defined as interventions on the system to increase the adoption of evidence-based innovations in usual care. Uh, recent review of the literature showed that there was about 75 discreet, evidence-informed implementation strategies out there that fell into nine broad categories. Uh, that's the Powell et al. 2015 reference to implementation science. I'm not going to go over them, but we do use them for them. The first one is partnerships. Everybody in here has talked a lot about the need to develop good partnerships with our clinical partners. I mean, really, the clinics, the pediatricians that we work with. So, in our trial, we first started with a partnership development uh, in 2010 at the Hospital. This is the, the general pediatrics clinic. And we worked with them for a, a lot of years. Katie uh, led actually a survey of the pediatricians um, within the Phoenix Children's Hospital in 2011. And we asked them, what are the things that you deal with um, that you commonly deal with that you would like additional help with uh, if it was available? And they said 100% of them actually said PC. 95% uh, of them said nutrition education or dietary advice for kids or, and for parents. Um, and then the other one was parent, general parent. So these are the kind of big, heavy hitter items that pediatricians actually want programs to be able to cover. At the time, family checkup was not really, um, uh, had not been developed in a way to actually address obesity or nutrition specifically, uh, but of course we were really good at parenting intervention. So that's where we started to actually shift our thinking towards obesity and health promotion. So in 2013, 2014, we were really funding from the Arizona State University to actually do a pilot trial with NPCH. 
And we did it with two clinics. One was general pediatrics, uh, which was an outpatient uh, primary care clinic, and one was the, uh, a non-alcohol fatty liver disease specialty clinic. So those were kids who have, uh, on average, 98 percent or above for BMI, and also have a complication of non-alcohol fatty liver disease. What we found essentially is that, that parents and our pediatricians, as well as our RDs, were being non-alcohol fatty liver disease, not highly acceptable in our family checkup approach. We found that there was some modifications. It was feasible to deliver. We couldn't do it kind of in the way that we had done at school and home visitation previously, so we had some minor adaptations. Um, but Danny actually mentioned one of them, which is a short visit, two visits out of three. Uh, so we're doing that as well. Then we also came up with an implementation strategy. This is a general implementation strategy, not a single discrete, but actually blended. It's multiple things that we have to do, and that's actually uh, coming up in an upcoming publication, uh, Smith & Law and Family Systems and Health. And then in 2016, uh, kind of in preparation for writing a marketing grant, um, he and I reached out to federally qualified health centers within uh, the Maricopa County Central Phoenix area. Uh, this is uh, Viagel Soul and Taros Health. And then since this time, since we actually uh, had positive uh, scores on our grant proposal, um, we started actually convening the community advisory board. And I'll talk a little bit more about who actually comprises that, because that, that's a little new piece. Um, and a couple things they had contributed to is in one of our meetings, they actually talked about um, what kinds of components we should actually include in our intervention, um, how we meant to integrate this program into um, just our community partners as well as other the other primary care agencies. And then the last thing they talked about was what kind of evidence we actually need to be able to show CMS, to show the state, and show other funders that this is actually a sustainable and reliable uh, program for obesity. So here is our community advisory board. This is actually a abbreviated list, it is not longer. Um, we have had overwhelming uh, interest in actually being part of our advisory board. I don't think anybody has said no. And she's a very good controlling people. <laughs> <laughs> Usually it's like, you're on an advisory board, but I guess. Uh, and so it has grown. It's not only really yet, but it has grown. Um, the important piece really to show, you, to show is that one of the, some of the key stakeholders that we've been able to engage is representation from the which is ACCESS, the Arizona Healthcare for Cost Containment System. Um, as well as state governments, we've got the Arizona Department of Health, Science, Health Services on our, our advisory board. Katie was also able to, to get two uh, representatives from uh, private health centers. So not just Medicaid, who was actually required by CDC to be on our, our, part of our advisory board. We were able to get independent plan holders too from United Health, uh, as well as Mercy Parents and South Arizona Heights. Then of course we have a whole range of folks who are expertise, who are experts in pediatric primary care, behavioral health, in care coordination, and in programming for uh, kids who have obesity. We also have some researchers uh, from Arizona State University who are obesity and health disparities experts, uh, which is really important for working in our population in Arizona. That's a lot of uh, nice American, as you can imagine. We also have a panel of national advisors and partners, which are folks who have done research, uh, advocacy. Uh, and work in national organizations like ABAP and, or ABP and AAP. Uh, and then this is a U18 mechanism for the CDC. So we have close collaboration with four uh, doctoral level folks uh, working in the obesity prevention and control branch of the National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, uh, led by, uh, I think it's Captain Heidi Plant. Yeah, Dr. Captain Heidi Plant. Um, so yeah, they're, they've been fantastic in helping us figure out a lot of different issues. Uh, and providing some really uh, good guidance for us. So when we think about testing implementation, that's really the thing that we're doing in this, in this trial, is we want to examine how evidence-based programs are adopted, scaled up, and sustained in community service delivery systems. And that's the definition actually given uh, by NIH. We also say you need to test the effect of implementation strategies on primary implementation outcomes, not necessarily on clinical outcomes. So we're thinking about things like adoption, adaptation, scale-up, and sustainability. Putting that into a broader context, this is the kind of eight primary buckets of implementation outcomes that we're interested in when we do implementation research. research. So acceptability, adoption, appropriateness, cost, feasibility, fidelity, uh, penetration or reach rates, um, and then also sustainability. And so one of the things that's really important to you is understand that the definition of implementation outcome, these are the effects, this is the direct effects of deliberate and purposive actions or implementation strategies um, that we are trying to employ. And if you want to look at this a little further out, 
the thought is that these implementation outcomes directly affect service outcomes. This is the IOM's 2006 um, service outcomes uh, list right here that has also a downstream effect on clinical outcomes. So in theory, you should be able to have a clinical effect by improving clinical or improving implementation outcomes. And of course, there's been a trial that ours where we're uh, testing both implementation and effectiveness we can relate them to each other and actually show that yes, the implementation does have an impact on how, uh, how, how effective the program is actually. So a special case of testing implementation is this hybrid trial where we simultaneously evaluate the clinical effectiveness of the program as well as the implementation. Um, it was intended, like having these kind of hybrid development program or uh, trial designs, were intended to speed translation in order to more efficiently take programs to scale. So rather than going through the, tra the, the traditional translational research pipeline in one step, efficacy <coughs> trial, effectiveness trial, then an implementation trial, and it's the same in trial, a scale up trial, you do a bunch of those things at the same time. <coughs> less money, uh, requires less time. So our particular uh, hybrid trial design is the type two, where we're equally interested in the effectiveness outcomes as well as our implementation outcomes. And we do that by actually testing two different implementation strategies that had this The other two types, type one and type three, respectively, uh, either emphasize the effectiveness or uh, the implementation. So here's our trial design. Uh, we have uh, family level randomization within the three clinics. I mentioned those three right between Florence Hospital and the Federally Qualified Health Center. And families are uh, randomized either to the family check for health intervention or to services as usual. So they get to have whatever program is already offered at the Federal Qualified Health Centers, which is unfortunately for us, good for families, unfortunately for us, it's actually really good. Uh, a couple of our, our clinics uh, already have a lot of services available, so it's going to be a hard uh, comparative effectiveness kind of a, a trial for us, but it's okay. And then really, this is where we're testing our implementation strategy. So the way that we're actually uh, delivering the family check for health differs depending on the context of the clinic. So within our federally qualified health centers, which have kind of a medical home model, we're able to test an integrated delivery approach. And this has kind of been, I think, what people have aspired to for a long time, is really kind of training the existing behavioral health providers to deliver the behavioral health intervention within uh, the IDI clinic itself, or at least on site. So there's a co-located care model within the all of the components of the NFPHC. In our other, uh, in the partnership with our Phoenix Children's Hospital, we're using a referral-based uh, care coordination approach. So they don't actually have the ability to have uh, behavioral health providers working within their fund. And so we partnered with them in order to test a referral model. So they're still identified, uh, but then they get referred out to our service providers that are housed uh, at Arizona State University and deliver our services either in the family's home, which has been successful in previous trials, or we actually have space at a foundation, um, so if the families don't want to in their home, we can meet them at a community uh, agency. The thing that stays the same uh, within these systems is the delivery system as well as our intervention. So we're not actually changing the content, the kind of person who delivers, uh, or anything else related to the intervention. It's held equal across all of these two implementation strategies, these two implementation conditions. And so really we're interested in, okay, so if we're trying to do these in two different ways, does it have a differential impact on families? Does it affect the way it is utilized? And really importantly, what's the cost of this? So delivering within the clinic and delivering at home is going to have some implications for how much it actually costs to work. So again, this is a really exciting thing for the last two minutes. Um, one of the really, uh, you know, we're really kind of uh, forward thinking in terms of having to meet this kind of sustainability uh, goal that CDC set out for us. So we all know that one of the biggest barriers to scaling is that we really have to assess implementation outcomes uh, on an ongoing basis, particularly the quality of the delivery. Uh, and resources are not really available for this in most settings. So one of the things that we needed to do uh, is to develop automated methods rather than trying to rely on observational human methods. So here's our automated or easy. Carlos is not here, he was Oh, and then uh, Dave Atkins and Sri Narayan, um, who are also uh, have, have had some experience in this uh, before, are part of this team. So one of the things that we know that are the kind of principles of automated coding is that it's really timely, it's really fast in being able to actually turn a raw data into a score. Um, it tends to be highly accurate. Um, hopefully the output is accessible to providers as well as service systems so they can kind of track over time really easily. Uh, and hopefully it's uh, both interpretable and unobtrusive as well. I mean, it doesn't have to have a whole lot of extra uh, measurement in order to do it. 
So we are actually doing a automated coding of session audio tapes. Uh, we can use video tapes as well to extract the audio first, and then use uh, different methods to figure out if it's been uh, delivered with fidelity. So here's actually a schematic of what happens during automated coding. We input a recording of program delivery, so a, literally a tape of a facilitator meeting with a family. And the machine grader, we train them to pick up on certain linguistic cues, like phonetic analyses, using speech recognition software and syntactic recognition um, to actually uh, identify these linguistic cues that are associated with fidelity. Uh, we can also, in some cases, use non-linguistic cues, like gesture recognition, uh, emotion state recognition. Uh, we might use the emotion state in this trial, but we're not sure. And what ends up actually happening is you have data that has turned out to be able to monitor the delivery of the intervention uh, over time uh, very efficiently and at low cost once it's developed. It is not cheap to develop, but once it's actually developed, if you want to see the standard number, you can see it's far <laughs> um, But once it's actually developed, to actually keep it running and run data through an automated coding system, it's going to be relatively expensive compared to uh, observational coding. Um,